When the owner of a small pharmacy uses his company's debit card to gamble at a casino, can a bankruptcy trustee later claw back that money from the casino as a fraudulent conveyance? The issue was recently faced by Judge Stuart Bernstein in the Southern District of New York. It presents a very common fact pattern, so I decided to do a commentary on the case. It's very common for a small business owner to ignore the niceties of separating his personal funds from his company funds. So a person that owns 100% of a company will use that company money to go on vacation, to pay a mortgage, or like this, to go crazy in Atlantic City. The owner will figure, not unreasonably, it's my company. I own 100% of it. So basically, it's my money. No one really cares until the company goes bankrupt and there's not enough money to pay creditors. Then it becomes a big deal because if the money uh, that was spent when the company was insolvent, if the, if the money was spent while the company was insolvent, it was not part of the company's equity, since there was no equity, since the company was insolvent. A trustee will, need, will then want to sue places like Harris Casino in Atlantic City if the owner of an insolvent company gambled away $895,000 uh, like what happened here. Uh, I thought the case was instructive for a couple of reasons. First, the opinion goes into the uh, issue of what is initial, an, an initial transferee versus a conduit, which is an important distinction in clawback law. It comes up quite a bit. Second, the case demonstrates the intractable problem faced by companies like Harrah's who accept company credit cards and checks for personal expenses and later get sued for fraudulent conveyance. The facts are as follows. James Zambri, the 100% owner of a specialty pharmacy, used the company debit card to withdraw $859,000 in cash on the floor of Harris Resort in Atlantic City from the cage, the betting cage, the, the chip distribution cage. And uh, unfortunately, he lost most of that money gambling. I'm sure he had a heck of a time, but the pharmacy later went bankrupt and the bankruptcy trustee sued Harris for, among other things, a constructive fraudulent conveyance. Harris first pointed the finger at Global, the debit card processor. Global's function was to confirm the availability of funds, get authorization from the card issuer, and communicate and okay to Harris uh, uh, that it could collect money from the bank. It would then get money from the bank and the next day wire the money to Harris. Harris argued that it's Global. That should be sued. Global got the money first. Global argued that it was a mere conduit of the funds from the bank, and it was also acting as a contractual agent for the casino. Therefore, it could not be the initial transferee. Global's argument was that it had no choice under the contract uh, to wire the funds uh, received by the bank to Harris. Since the funds were not under the custody and control of Global, it was a conduit, and the court agreed. The casino wanted to be a subsequent transferee, not an initial transferee, for a very good reason. A subsequent transferee who receives the money from the initial transferee can defend against a fraudulent conveyance case by arguing that it gave value and acted in good faith and without knowledge of the avoidability of the transfer. The absolutely critical difference between 550B1, which protects subsequent transferees, and 548C, which protects initial transferees is this. Under 550B1, it doesn't matter who got the value as long as value was given, as long as the receiver of those funds gave any kind of value. It doesn't have to go to the, the, the debtor. Under 548C, it is imperative that the debtor got the value in exchange for the debtor's money. And that is a huge difference. Here, Harris uh, undoubtedly gave value in providing a thrilling a gambling, uh, sorry, gaming uh, experience to Mr. Zambri, but that value went to Mr. Zambri, not the pharmacy, not the debtor. Under 550B1, if it was a subsequent transferee, it uh, wouldn't matter. Under 548, uh, the casino loses because the debtor got no value whatsoever. Judge Bernstein ruled that the casino gave zero value back to the pharmacy in exchange for the pharmacy's money and since Harris was the initial transferee, could not show reasonably equivalent value, which it had to show or give back the money to the uh, debtor's bankruptcy trustee, which it ended up having to do. The end result seems ridiculously unfair to Harris. How is it 
uh, how is a casino or it's or the even the agent global possibly going to know that either Mr. Zambri did not have the authority to use company money to buy uh, poker chips? Or, or is it the burden of the casino every time it gets a company debit card to demand to review the officer or employee, or employee employment agreement or contract? We also need to check to see whether the company was insolvent. Because if it was, if it was solvent, there's not a problem. So the chip cage would have to have full-time lawyers, contract evaluators, and valuation experts. The, the absurdity demonstrates the basic truth that a law that imposes liability on defendants who could not possibly have any forewarning of a clawback or any ability to avoid liability is simply an unfair law. In my opinion, these kinds of fraudulent conveyance cases against innocent vendors should be outlawed. The action should be brought against the officers or managers that use company funds when they know the company is insolvent. How's anybody else going to know that? Uh, if truth be told, I don't have a lot of compassion for casinos in general who seem to profit from problem gamblers. So in this particular case, what goes around comes around.